right, so just to clarify, a couple of differences between plant and animal cells as far as tonicity goes. So animals, multicellular animals, our cells are isotonic to the extracellular environment. Our cells really don't have a way of controlling water balance. So for example, your blood cells need to be isotonic because if you were to put your blood cells in pure water, they would swell up and explode. They don't have a way of getting rid of excess water. And if your cells were in salt water, they would shrivel up. So although as an organism as a whole, we may be able to control our water balance by drinking more water or certain hormones may make us urinate more to get rid of excess water, our cells themselves are bathed in an isotonic environment. Plants, on the other hand, are always going to have cells that are hypertonic to their extracellular environment. In other words, what what happens in a plant is that the water's coming in at the roots, pure, you know, pure water, and that's going to make the outside of the cells hypotonic to the inside. And that's okay because unlike our cells, plants have the central vacuole and they have a cell wall. So what happens with a plant cell is that the vacuole swells up really big full of this water and then it pushes on the cell membrane and creates pressure and that's called turgor pressure and that's what keeps plant cells stiff. So even though you have fresh water constantly flowing outside of the plant cell, the plant cell itself is not going to swell up too much um, because the, the cell wall is going to prevent that. And that's what plants want. That's when a plant looks healthy. If a plant cell was in an isotonic solution, it would actually uh, look kind of wilted. And worst case scenario, if you were to put salt water on a plant, you'll actually cause the plant cell to sort of collapse. The cell membrane will pull away from the cell wall. The vacuole loses all its water, and you're going to see this in the lab, and it's called plasmolysis. So that's a real problem. That would actually kill the plant cells. So again, uh, animal cells are isotonic to their environment. Plant cells tend to be hypertonic to their environment or to their extracellular environment. This is just sort of a walkthrough of, of the same thing, just explaining that how, how water goes through plants. So it comes in at the roots and it travels towards the leaves, and there's a couple things causing that. We've talked about this when we did our chapter on water. There's cohesion and adhesion to the xylem, and the xylem are like little tiny capillaries, so this is capillary action. And then what really pulls it along is evaporation at the leaves. That's called transpiration. So at the leaf, there are these little holes or pores. The pores are called stoma, and uh, that's the name of the actual hole, and these uh, organelles are called stomata. And what stomata do is, if you look at the picture down here at the bottom, they can open and close. So when they're open, carbon dioxide and water, I'm sorry, carbon dioxide and oxygen can be exchanged, you know, so that the plant can do photosynthesis and cell respiration, etc. But unfortunately, whenever the stomata open, you're also going to have transpiration or evaporation of water. And although that helps to pull water up a plant, this could also cause a problem because if it's really windy or it's a drought and there's not a lot of water, the plant doesn't want to lose too much water by transpiration. So what will happen is these stomata, notice what happens, the vacuoles actually lose some of their water and now these two cells called guard cells, they collapse closed. And so now the stoma or the pore, the hole, is closed. And now the plant won't lose water um, whereas it would when the stomata are open. And obviously a plant has to open them at some point. I mean, that's sort of like us. We can't just stop breathing. Plants can't stop breathing permanently either. They need those gases, carbon dioxide and oxygen. Um, so that's how plants control their water loss. Now, another example of osmoregulation or controlling water balance in an organism um, is looking at ammonia. And I've noticed this has been on the AP exam a couple of times, even though there's nothing in the curriculum that says we have to cover this specific example, but they seem to like to use it. So whenever you metabolize protein, when you break protein down, one of the things that, that happens is the amino group comes off of the amino acids. Then you can use uh, proteins for energy. Well, that amino group will turn into ammonia. And ammonia is very, very toxic. So you have your cells possibly breaking down proteins all the time making toxic ammonia. And so it's kind of interesting the way different vertebrate animals get rid of ammonia based on the availability of water. So fish 
are surrounded by fresh water, right? They have all the water they need. So when they make toxic ammonia, they just use the water around them to flush it out. So they basically kind of pee all the time. They lose the ammonia at their gills. And that's great for them because ammonia being very toxic, but it doesn't take any energy to make ammonia. So they make ammonia, they flush it out with water, and no problem. Now we don't have a constant supply of water. We live on land. How are we able to conserve water if we also make ammonia? And the answer is we use energy to convert ammonia to something called urea. And urea is kind of, it's the stuff that makes your urine yellow. It's, it's only a very small percentage. Your urine is mostly water. So urea is less toxic than ammonia. It does take energy to make urea. So the drawback is we have to use energy to make urea from ammonia. The benefit is we don't need a constant water supply. We can, we can live with a lot less water in our diet because we convert ammonia to urea, which is less toxic. And then we make urine as our waste product. The really cool one are the fit, are the uh, the birds and the reptiles, and particularly reptiles that even live in the desert. So what they do is they convert the toxic ammonia into something called uric acid. Now this takes even more energy to make. So again, the drawback here is it takes energy to make urea, and it takes no energy to make ammonia. So we need to use energy to make urea, uh, but it requires less water. Desert organisms, it takes even more energy to make uric acid, but uric acid requires almost no water. In fact, if you've ever had a bird or a snake, you'll notice they don't pee. And if you had a snake, you probably never gave it water. I have lizards. I don't give them any water. They get all the water they need from their food. How are they able to live with so little water in their diet? And the answer is because they convert ammonia to, ure to uric acid, which is a solid. It's that white stuff that's in bird poop or snake poop. You'll see like green stuff. And that's the poop, and then there'll be this dot of white stuff. That's the uric acid. It's non-toxic, so it's, it's less toxic. It doesn't require any water, really, to flush it out of the body. And so they're able to live their lives with much less water in their diet than a mammal and an amphibian or a fish. So this is just an example of how different organisms, based on their water supply, can, can control water loss by some of their metabolism. Uh, the last thing in this little section, just some other ways that organisms can control their water balance. We talked about the paramecium in uh, the last chapter, how they had a contractile vacuole, looks like this right here, and what it does is it squirts out excess water. So even though they're living in fresh water, which would technically be hypotonic environment, um, they also have, a, I believe, something called a pellicle that's sort of like, like a, almost like a little exoskeleton, so that helps too. But this would be an example of a way a freshwater organism can get rid of extra water. Saltwater organisms, they can do other things. Saltwater fish are living now, if you think about it, saltwater fish would be in an environment that could be, if, for a normal organism, hypertonic. That would tend to make the fish get dehydrated. Well, what they do is, if you were to check the balance of solutes in their blood compared to ours, they actually have a higher solute concentration to sort of balance with the salt. So if the seawater, let's say, is 10% salt, and in their blood they maintain 10% solutes, they'll be isotonic, even though our blood may only be 5% solutes. So they maintain a higher solute concentration. The other thing they can do is some of them actively pump out salt. Some fish do this. Uh, crocodiles actually have salt glands, so they can drink salt water and then just pump out the extra salt. So this is another way that organisms might control their balance of water or osmoregulation.